Okay, so let's go with our next presentation. This is a, a, a keynote presentation uh, from my colleague, Ville. I, I have renounced to pronounce your family name. I'm sorry. Eh? That's Voitilainen. Voitilainen. Oh, oh. I will forget in one second. <laughs> ah, yeah. So uh, he, uh, he has been for a long time the a representative of the Finland national body in the ISO C++ uh, committee and he works uh, currently for the QT uh, company and he is going to present uh, how we integrate senders and receivers with the QT library. All right. So, in addition to that, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, high-level introduction into how senders and receivers work. I'm displeased with the, uh, with the uh, introductory material that we have seen. There are, of course, uh, introductions by Eric Nibbler himself on YouTube that you, you might be able to find. But uh, let's go into it. I'm, I'm going to try to be relatively brief about this so that we can get to look at uh, how it works in practice with Qt code. But uh, gen the general concept is that senders represent asynchronous work that can complete in three different ways, either with a successful completion, which is actually an overload set of possible values that it can send, so there, there may be multiple forms of success completion. There can be multiple forms of uh, error reporting as well, uh, but that's a different completion overload set, and then a sender can report that the work has been cancelled. Receivers uh, are observers, observers of these completions, so they react to what senders send, and the, uh, that triplet of possible completions is uh, exclusive. So a sender either sends a value, an error, or, or is cancelled. So a receiver will only ever get one of those completions. Schedulers represent execution contexts, uh, like uh, event loops in, in application frameworks. So it's important for certain reusable algorithms that they give you a sender that sends nothing. It's just a completion. So it's, it's like an asynchronous version of a uh, function returning void without any arguments. When we have that, we can se sequence other senders onto these scheduler senders. But of course, in addition to uh, having those senders that uh, schedulers uh, supply, we can actually have senders that aren't produced by schedulers. So when we have these generic building blocks in place, we can use generic adapters that tie continuations to senders or cause senders to initiate their work on a particular execution context or cause sender continuations to run on a particular context. Those are pretty much the basic building blocks that we are going to need. So with this model, we can, when using those uh, algorithmic adapters, we can synchronously build a work graph. So you bind the continuations and, uh, and the context switches for the uh, initiation of the work and the, uh, and the uh, continuations. And that is done synchronously, so there's nothing concurrent running when you build the work graph. And then when you have the work graph, you separately start it and run the work. And at that point, it runs asynchronously. So this is useful because you don't have to worry about concurrency when you define the work graph. At that point, there's nothing concurrent running. So. What we get out of this is that the uh, continuation setup is generic and reusable, and, the, and so is the uh, context switch handling. The actual domain-specific work that is going to be your business logic 
is uh, separated from the generic parts but can be easily combined with it. So a brief explanation of how this works. So a sender connects to a receiver or rather the other way around uh, by doing a connect and that produces an operation state. And the operation state is what you then later start separately. So once you have all the connections between possibly nested senders and possibly nested receivers, we can then start that whole word graph. And uh, we use these generic uh, pre-packaged algorithms to do all this. So we have algorithms like then transfer wet value. They take a sender and they produce a different sender because it has a different connect that can give different receivers to the underlying sender. So we basically wrap the connect so that we can give a different kind of a receiver to the underlying sender that will plumb things the right way. And from that uh, wrapped sender, we also return a different operation state. And we can, of course, send whatever completions we like from that sender to the actual underlying receiver. So a straightforward connect just gives a receiver to a sender and it then has a handle to it. It knows that that's the target of the completions. But uh, if we look at a couple of algorithms, like then for instance, so then takes a sender and a callable. It will wrap the connect so that the sender gets an internal receiver defined by then. And that receiver will invoke the callable, but also uh, invoke a subsequent underlying receiver with the result of the callable. So basically the uh, return value of that callable is sent onwards into the value completion. So what this looks like is that when we do the uh, connect of a receiver to a wrapped sender, what actually ends up happening is that the algorithm supplies that then receiver to the actual sender and that then receiver knows about the callable and the actual underlying receiver. And then when the sender con completes, it will invoke the actual then receiver, which will then invoke the callable, get its result, and then complete the underlying receiver. Uh, in a similar fashion, when we do uh, uh, transfers of completions to a different scheduler, transfer takes a sender and a scheduler. So it wraps connect again so that what the uh, original sender gets is a internal receiver uh, defined by this algorithm. And when you do that completion from the sender, uh, the uh, internal receiver will actually go to the scheduler, uh, invoke its schedule operation, and get a sender out of that. It will then sequence a new sender to, on top of that sender. So the original value sent by the very original sender that we are wrapping uh, <clears throat> gets sent by that sender on that context onwards to the actual receivers. So this is a little bit complicated, but it's, it's kind of simple as well, because what happens here is that the original completion causes a new, new, op uh, no, new operation to be scheduled on a different scheduler, and it will just convey the values there. So what it does is that it takes the original sender connects the uh, transfer receiver to that, and that transfer receiver's completion will cause the uh, scheduling of, of oops, scheduling of, of the work, of new work on that scheduler. And then what ends up happening is that we run 
that sequenced send sender there, and that receiver in that picture is the original receiver. So it will get a completion on a new execution context. And another building block for which I don't have a uh, fancy illustration how it works. Let value takes a sender and a callable, and that callable returns another sender. So the way it works is that the first sender completes, and once that happens, uh, let value will invoke the callable that produces a sender and the algorithm just returns that sender. Uh, so this allows sequencing senders onto another. That's not really the main use case for let value. Uh, there's a, in libunifex there's a, there's a separate algorithm called sequence that since the current uh, studexec implementation by NVIDIA doesn't have a separate sequence algorithm, I'm just <clears throat> shamelessly abusing let value to do the same thing because it's in some practical cases necessary to be able to sequence senders this way. So when you then, then have these algorithms that modify your work graph, you can pipe them which is actually nesting, but it, it looks like a pipe operation. So we have a sender, we uh, pipe it to a continuation, we pipe that to another continuation and to another in this example. So it looks like a sequence of, of operations and uh, in many ways acts like one, but it really produces one sender that has nested senders inside it. And that kind of uh, implements a decorator pattern. So there's, the, the, there's a nesting of the senders and they can decorate the uh, connect operations. When they decorate the uh, connect operations, they, they, they can then decorate the operation states and they're starting and uh, ultimately <coughs> uh, they can decorate the uh, completions to the actual receivers and from there to, to the actual continuations. So that means that they can intercept and transform or reroute the uh, calls to, to the uh, nested, nested senders, nested operation states, nested receivers. Transfer is an example of that kind of rerouting. You have a completion, it gets teleport it to a very different execution context and actually completes there. So what actually gets produced, instead of having a sequence of nested Russian dolls, you have actually nested Russian dolls there. So now, how this actually works in Qt. So a scheduler, since it needs to produce that nullable um, sender, which is re really just a plain and simple com completion of no work <coughs> on that execution context. What we need is an event loop and Qthread has an event loop in it. So the main threads, uh, the main event loop actually has a Qthread underneath it. So the way the adaptation works is that Qthreads are convertible to schedulers. And in addition to that, uh, all Q objects are senders uh, with this adaptation or, well, to be very precise, Q objects themselves are not, but Q object signals are. So we can take a combination of a Q object and its signal and turn that into a sender. And that's how we can then use this to program with Q, existing Qt facilities using, using the uh, flavor of programming that this framework provides. A couple of ad additional things. Uh, we can tie code routines into, into this framework, uh, the, that general uh, explanation of what code routines are. So they are just uh, functions that can do, do additional things, suspend and uh, return control and then resume. 
in addition to having the initial call and the uh, ultimate return. So uh, we can then, of course, for asynchronous purposes of asynchrony, we can uh, initiate asynchronous work and suspend the coroutine and resume it when the asynchronous work is done. So the high level uh, attraction of this is, of course, that you don't need to use callback <coughs> in your code. You can write linear looking code that is asynchronous because the actual code routine is the, uh, the actual uh, continuation is the code that follows your suspense, uh, suspension point. And that's just like a, a, a flow or fall through code kind of. So senders in general are code routines. You can co wait on a sender. When you have a code routine that uses a sender where code routine a type like the uh, task type that's provided by this framework, <clears throat> you can use code routines as senders, which means that you can bind continuations to them. And of course, you can then transfer those continuations to other execution contexts. Which basically brings the uh, brings the uh, missing bit that uh, everybody has lamented ever since uh, code routines were introduced into C plus plus twenty, as in well, how do you use them? With the uh, senders and receivers uh, framework, you can just use the then continuations to to bind continuations to code routines. You can use the transfer algorithms to send those uh, continuations to wherever and in practi practice it's rather important that, uh, that you're able to get the continuations of your code routine and send that to your uh, main event loop. So let's see, I need to mess with the monitors a bit. Practical examples of this. So we have here a bit of code that does a chunked uh, HTTP GET download. So we are using a Linux kernel image for this because it's a, it's a convenient size and we can, we can actually use a four megabyte chunks for it. So what we are doing here is that we first, of course, just initiate the head request because that we can just fire away. Uh, but what we do after that is that we uh, get the uh, completion signal from it and we turn that into a sender. We do a transfer of its continuation here. We don't strictly need to, we are running here on the uh, main, uh, main event loop, but that's just there as a placeholder suggesting that if you would want to send those continuations to a different thread, you could. What happens here next is that uh, we do the uh, uh, actual continuation of, of that uh, get operation, uh, head operation. So when that head operation is complete, we do a little bit of uh, stuff here. Uh, mainly that we uh, update the internal content length of this code and then we uh, tell the user interface that we have a, have a content length. And then we do a little bit of housekeeping. We need to clean up the uh, network reply. Next thing that we do is that we build a actual GET request. So we are using a just algorithm here just because we have a network request. We want to create a sender pipeline from that request. You'll soon see why. But basically we just do this just operation to turn that plain network request object into a sender that just is a sender. When it runs, it will just immediately send the request as a value, we then bind a continuation to that that invokes our setup request code here. 
And that's, that's just a single sender, the just plus the, plus the then continuation. We give that to let value so that when that combination runs and completes, after that, we go to the uh, second part of this let value and we do the actual HTTP GET request here. And then out of this piece of the pipeline, we uh, turn the uh, uh, completion signal for that GET request into a sender. And then, of course, uh, we do uh, an actual operation here that uh, we, we just basically need to have a sender be uh, returned from this pipeline. And then so we just do this then dance here. And then we follow up with the actual completion of what our application does after that, uh, that get request completes. So we have another transfer here. It's again unnecessary per se for this example, but uh, you could use a different transfer there to transfer to a different thread. But anyway, the continuation that we run when the get uh, request completes is that we do a um, little bit of uh, internal update, updating of, of the current state, namely the uh, amount of bytes downloaded so far. We uh, report the download progress to the user interface and again clean up the uh, reply. We take that pipeline that does the uh, GET request and its continuation and we uh, pipe that to a completion predicate, which checks whether we have downloaded all of the bytes, the full content length. And then we run that with a repeat effect until. So that's what the predicate is doing there. It's, it's checking whether the repeat algorithm needs to continue doing this. So basically what we have here is an asynchronous loop without, of course, writing an actual, well, I am writing an actual loop, it just doesn't look like a loop. That's why there's that repeated get, that's why it starts with a request that's turned into a sender because the pipeline needs to be senders. You can't just have uh, plain values there. So then, we use let value to sequence these things together. So we take the uh, head request that we built and we, uh, we uh, sequence the uh, repeated get operation after that. And then when we are done with this uh, whole pipeline, we just spawn the work. What this will do is that when I run the whole shebang, it will do the download and uh, report its progress on the way. So we do a chunked HTTP download, four megabytes at a time, from the uh, kernel, <laughs> Linux kernel HTTP uh, website, where all the kernel releases are. I need to wait for that to continue because there's there's a cleanup problem that needs to be fixed by certain to-do items here. I may be able to say something about that if we have time. Uh, okay. Come on. Right, so what we have there, oops, on behave, is that we have um, asynchronous code. So we have an asynchronous head request that we do. We have multiple asynchronous, uh, what the hell did you do? Uh, multiple asynchronous um, get requests. 
but it's in code that looks perfectly linear, even though... So with these transfers, you could, of course, send the uh, continuations to different threads and they can just automatically uh, return the execution flow to, to where we are in the, uh, in the pipeline. You can jump to a different thread and go back or come back and that still looks like linear code. Uh, but uh, let's look at how it really works when it's, I mean, we can really linearize it when we use coroutines instead. So we have the same thing here written using coroutines. There's that initial setup where we just zero the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the content length and bytes downloaded. We do the same thing in, in the other version. So here what we do is that we just fire the head request like we did before, but we, instead of building that repeat pipeline or any kind of pipeline, we just invoke the uh, conversion of the uh, Q object and its signal to a sender like we did before, and we co-await it. That will, of course, suspend this coroutine. It will resume once that signal is actually triggered. Then we follow up with the, uh, uh, we set the content length and notify the user interface about that. And then we loop the GET request. So we uh, set up the GET request. Uh, this, of course, takes into account the, currently, the current information of how many bytes have been downloaded. So it sends an offset, uh, offsetted uh, GET request saying what the, uh, what the starting point is and how many bytes to get. And then we just uh, launch the, the GET request and again take its completion signal and just go co-await it. We update the user interface uh, clean up that uh, single get operations reply, and then we loop. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to do a transfer using the coroutine uh, sender? Because I, 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 don't, I don't see how you can do a transfer after integration to different threads that you gave in the... Uh, so, yes, you can do that. Uh, I, I could... Um, transfer this particular sender if I so wanted. Um, so <clears throat> what that will of course do is that uh, the transfer will happen there and do you, you can do the uh, uh, move of the continuation to a different context. But this particular coroutine will then resume when that whole sender pipeline completes. That it, it comes back just fine if, if I want to do it that way. And I, I can, of course, transfer to another other thread and come back and then have the code routine resume that way. That's also easy to do. But nevertheless, this is seriously linear looking code. There's no funny pipelines that you have to build. And it, it works the same way. It does the same thing. Uh, so, if you can afford uh, having your function be such that it has this task type as, as its result, and you, of course, externally, when you use, when you call a function like this, you need to actually spawn that task on something. So, here we do it in the function. Let's see, where is it? Uh, the fetch file. <clears throat> so in the fetch file, we spawn the work. Uh, in the coroutine version, we uh, call the coroutine, we get the task out of it, but we do have to spawn the task. The coroutine is initially suspended, it doesn't do anything. So when we call the function that is a coroutine, uh, this thing here, none of this code runs. It doesn't even zero the bytes downloaded, etc. 
when you invoke a coroutine that represents a sender in this framework, that coroutine suspends initially. It doesn't do anything. Then when we actually spawn it, it will run until its first suspension point and then suspend there and uh, resume <coughs> afterwards. So uh, let's look at a slightly different example. So I wrote a different kind of illustration of, uh, of what this thing does because I, I wanted to play with uh, how to write these programs in a more modular, separated fashion. Uh, with, uh, so instead of writing that kind of a one big pipeline and doing everything in it, uh, I wanted to see what it looks like if I put some separation of concerns into this. So here we have a relatively simple pipeline. We just call these greeting functions in, uh, in three, three different threads. Uh, there's an initial greeting that we do there just to sort of get the <coughs> user interface current state correct. And then we just spawn that pipeline like we always do. So the greeting function is relatively simple in the sense that it uh, transfers to a particular target scheduler, runs a greeting there, pipes that into a launching of a timer, and then we sequence uh, the uh, observation of the timer's timeout result here. And then we uh, notify the user interface. Uh, the uh, running of the timer is a funny trick in the sense that we need to, in the midst of our pipeline, we need to transfer to the main thread because you can't start two timers in different threads. So we transfer to the main thread and then invoke the timers start. <laughs> Since we are using let value here, we want to get a sender out of this pipeline job, so we just return an empty just. And how it then continues is that we go to this other let value where we uh, bind the actual completion of the timer and then we bind, bind continuations to that that actually do the UI, UI notification. The UI notification simply tells the UI what thread we are in. And this basically just does a very nice little ping, ping pong between those threads. So it moves from one thread to, to another in that sequence that we built. So it runs those greetings there, delayed, delayed by the timer. So we can, we can build these uh, uh, pipelines of, of, uh, of cute facilities, even, even for things that uh, require to be run in a particular context. So here we do, <clears throat> as opposed to the HTTP example, that, that's kind of toyish in the sense that it doesn't, doesn't use multiple threads and doesn't actually transfer to them, this one does, because it's it's using those three different threads to, to run the actual greetings. That's, that's what those boxes represent. Those are three different threads and it switches the uh, execution flow from one thread, thread to another and then comes back. And that's just uh, driven by the, uh, by the timing that otherwise those uh, switches would of course be immediate but we have that uh, slight timer delay there to, to make it uh, more, <clears throat> more illustrative. And then, of course, we, we can have these separate functions here because we are basically <coughs> returning senders from these functions. This, of course, means that these need to be function temp templates and, well, they are, because that's, that is a template, it's using the uh, 
C plus plus twenty shortcut syntax. But uh, yeah, it's it's returning a sender, and that has a funny or well, the pipeline sender that I built that has a very funny type uh, type that you wouldn't want to write out anyway. Of course, if if you have a context where you need to have ABI stable types, uh, the framework provides type array senders. So there's an any sender that can uh, dynamically allocate whatever sender and then operate on it. The end result, of course, is that uh, we have that uh, roughly 150 lines of, uh, of template code that adapts the Q thread and the uh, Q object signal. Uh, there's also an additional twist where uh, I can produce a tuple out of a signal so that it's possible to use any kind of sender. I mean, any kind of cute signal, even if it has multiple arguments with a coroutine, because I can wrap it into a tuple and then just correlate on that tuple result. So a relatively small amount of code and it makes all of Qt sender and receiver compatible because it can wrap any, any kind of signal and turn that signal into a sender. That's pretty much all of it. Questions, comments? Oh, I should add, I briefly mentioned that reason why I wanted to wait for that download to complete. Um, let's see. Um, we need to shut down this work so that we tell the async scope uh, to give us a completion sender when it's empty. And then we need to wait for it. Um, that wait is currently okay -ish in the sense that if you, if you run any, everything in separate threads, you can, of course, wait for it like that, but uh, I'm going to need to fix that because, in general, that's just horrible. It will deadlock your application if your uh, asynchronous work that would run in the main event loop isn't complete. So what I need to add to this implementation is cancellation support and a waiting function that will wait for those completions by using a nested QT event loop so that it doesn't block the whole thread. <laughs> Sync wait does block the whole thread. This is untenable in general and going forward. But uh, <clears throat> once I'm done with, uh, with these conference things, I'm going to spend some time doing that properly so that I have full cancellation support and that kind of uh, fiber weight instead of a uh, uh, sink weight, and then then the cleanup will be uh, will be possible to do in such a fashion that it uh, cleans up properly and never deadlocks. And then I can also write a RAI wrapper for that, so that uh, I can have a type that does that that weighting automatically in its destructor. This has been a uh, uh, this has caused a fair amount of discussion in the committee how to clean these things up and it's unfortunately so that to do it properly with an application framework like this you need a application framework specific solution because it needs to be an nested event loop that the framework knows about so obviously we can standardize that because there's multiple frameworks that need a specific solution. But yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. So, questions? Hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, maybe it's obvious, but I didn't read the sender receiver proposal. Is there something like a multiplexer in the standard, or do you need to build one yourself if you want a sender to go to multiple receivers? There is a split algorithm that allows you to split the sender into two senders, and then you can have that basically splits a pipeline. 
I should also, of course, mention that uh, these current tenders are one-shot operations. So the uh, pipeline that you build runs once. There's a future consideration of having uh, sequence senders so that they will produce multiple uh, completions. That, that's actually going to be necessary for, for things like UI events because, of course, you're going to have a stream of mouse events or whatever. It's, it's a never-ending thing. But for now, what we have is uh, single shot senders, uh, but you can split a pipeline with the split algorithm. Uh, of, well. of course, you, you can, in your continuation, do whatever splitting you like if, if you want to do it that way. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. And uh, regarding using standard exec or some implementation of senders receivers, uh, this question is for you to give me like uh, your estimation of how much do you think the proposal will change until it is inside? Like, if I start writing code for standard uh, using standard exec, um, would most of it survive standardization? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> so the usage has been unchanged for quite some time. So all that pipeline using code that I showed is uh, has been unchanged for quite some time. I think there's a so there's a possibility that transfer will be renamed to uh, to complete on or something like that. But uh, other than that, I don't think the uh, the the, the uh, use side of it is going to change. What is going to change, unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, unfortunately in the sense that you need to change it but fortunately, because it's better, is the uh, opt-in adaptation. So if you have a type that needs to be a sender, uh, currently you need to write a tag invoke overload for it, uh, for, the, uh, for the connect customization point. Uh, when we are finally going to standardize, you're going to write a connect member function. Okay, good. Well, in my opinion, that's nicer. Hopefully, for nicer error messages. Um, but okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean uh, that change was done because uh, using ADL overloads is terrible. You basically have an infinite uh, overload set, unless, of course, you do all sorts of trickery that you can find if you, if you look into the implementation. It's doing all kinds of detail namespaces and that kind of nonsense. And uh, various people in the committee had uh, had gripes about that, so I wrote a proposal that suggested that those opt-ins should just be member functions, and we approved it in the last meeting in Tokyo. So when this proposal actually lands into the working draft, which should hopefully be in June in, in St. Louis, it will have that uh, member function-based uh, opt-in mechanism. Okay, thanks. So, so that is a change that you are going to need to accommodate. Of course, if, if you're using the uh, NVIDIA implementation, the StudioExec, for example, it's probably going to support both. It's going to support tag invokes and, and member functions so that uh, you don't have to migrate immediately. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you for the very clear presentation. Um, I'm wondering if the code examples are available somewhere and yeah this code is actually on uh, git.qtio uh, under under my my repository is uh, Daniel is there a good way to uh, document that or communicate that sort of things to the audience of this to everybody. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the. Uh, I'm proxy. Yeah, I'll I'll give you the uh, URL for that. But uh, it is it is indeed uh, publicly available. The repository was secret until a couple of weeks ago when I decided that well, what the hell? There's no point in keeping it hidden. Um, the plan is to integrate this stuff into a future Qt version. Uh, 
hopefully sometime soon when I get, uh, get rid of my current uh, Android related tasks so that I'm able to actually <clears throat> write the patch to integrate this into, into Qt base. So a partial reason why it was hidden code was that we had some <laughs> contemplations about whether we want to do something special for commercial customers. We came to the conclusion that we don't, that we are just going to provide this functionality to everybody. So that's why the repository is now open, but I can't accept patches to it because I, I need to write it all, all myself get it on into Qt and then we can accept patches for that if we have contributors uh, if based on the uh, regular patch submission rules of the project. But uh, while it's still in the uh, <laughs> pre-integration limbo, I, I can't take external contributions for it, but that's fine. Awesome, thank you. And one last thing. So in, in the first example, uh, when you were downloading the Linux kernel, uh -huh. uh, like chunk by chunk, what would happen if some of those chunks uh, like failed or something? So yeah, I mean that that example pipeline has no error handling. So of course you would need to uh, build build a different pipeline segment for the uh, error signal of the uh, of the uh, <laughs> network reply. I haven't have, haven't shown that in these examples. They are a bit too optimistic to be used used in real life. But what what you would practically do is that you would turn that uh, error signal into a sender and build build some sort of handling for that. Of course, probably so that you would abort the uh, the normal download in case of error, or you could retry it. Of course. But yeah, that's, uh, these are oversimplified for illustration purposes. But it's the usual thing with slideware, that they, they tend to cover the happy paths only. But I, I will probably eventually uh, produce examples that do more error handling so that they are more realistic in my copious free time. <laughs> okay, any other question? Okay, thank you very much, Ville. Uh -huh. But don't go. So, wait. So, uh, we are ahead of time. So, coffee is planned for 11. So, don't run. First thing uh, to say. Second uh, thing I wanted uh, to say uh, as you may know, the ISO C++ standard committee is a committee of volunteers. And that means that you can also volunteer. Uh, we like to encourage people to participate through their national bodies in, in the committee because the committee is not a committee of experts. And that's important. I. Uh, I think I, I am not the only one who thinks that there are too many experts in the committee. And that's bad. That's bad because that makes us to forget the average programmer, the average software developer. And sometimes this leads at, us to very complicated solutions. So the first thing I wanted to say is I if you are in Spain, just uh, let me know if you are interested in participating in any way. If you are in a different country, I, I would encourage to participate through your national body. And then, because we have like half an hour before coffee, and we need to do something. <laughs> so that, that I do not get complained that we ask for coffee before time. And because you have here, I counted six uh, different uh, members of the ISO C++ committee. This is your opportunity to one, make questions, and two, and better, make requests. <laughs> I, 
I'm not saying that your request will be heard or followed, but you can make requests. So, what do you want to know about the committee? What do, would you like to see in a feature version of C++? Uh, you were not. Static assets with user-provided messages. Static assets, but you can write a static asset right now. So, so that that means that you need compile time, a string composition. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Okay, that looks like you are going to write a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have a proposal for that. I think either David or Barry Revzin wrote it. So to be able to programmatically produce a compile time uh, output. I mean, it's it's just, it's not necessarily just diagnostics. You can just uh, print whatever you like as the uh, output of your, from your compilation. So I think that's a recognized need and uh, we have proposals for it. I expect that to happen. Uh, it's hard to say whether that will be in C plus plus twenty six as a as an adjunct of of reflection, but uh, I would think there's a decent chance of that because there's there's splendid amounts of uh, of reflection use cases where you want to use that kind of uh, diagnostic prints, and then there's of course non free non reflection use cases for that. So I. <laughs> I, I would uh, half optimistically hope that we should get that in, in 26. But as always, we can, can't really promise that. Yeah. Okay, that Follow-up question, is format, uh, standard format const expert? Uh, I think not now, I would say. No. I, I, I think Victor had uh, some idea, but nothing concrete yet. Yeah, the problem is that you can have arbitrary custom formatters, and we can't really require all of those to, to be uh, uh, constant, uh, constant expression compatible. If, if you have a formatter that simply requires uh, some runtime stuff, then that's of course not going to work at compile time. I, I think there were some other restrictions in the in how the formatters work that it's it's not going to be fully constant constant foldable. So apparently format is not a solution. I I don't know whether it could be uh, tweaked to be to to be more fully constant per compatible. I, I haven't looked at that into uh, into that much detail. The experts said that there's there's something in it that prevents that. As you see, experts love to go into tiny details instead of giving a reasonable answer. <laughs> That's us. So, any. One thing that would simplify uh, learnability, I think, is removing standard move pessimization on return. I think there, there was a proposal by that from Brian B, and it was rejected. <laughs> yeah, this is um, controversial, I think. But that's something I'd like. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, maybe someone else can say it better, but uh, I, I know about that paper. I went to that paper. I talked with Brian uh, last February, and <clears throat> it's not so simple because then basically, like, 
uh, ST move being part of the the library and basically like it would require that you have some kind of a special cases for STD move and then you start going into kind of a dangerous territory that you need to have exceptions and that's why it just died and he's, he's not planning to continue it but yeah Oh yeah, this is warming up. Uh, yeah, maybe this is kind of uh, like the regular developer. So <laughs> I speaking, right? So yeah, so I was just wondering uh, if there's a plan or proposal or something like that to add something like a JSON library uh, to C++, something similar to Python that you have import JSON, something like that. It's just that uh, there are like a, a, a very long list of uh, JSON libraries out there that are implemented in C++, right? And some uh, are optimized for performance and some for readability. So I was wondering if, if that came up at some point. Anybody? So, yeah, there's been talk about something like that. I don't recall seeing a concrete proposal recently. The problem there is that, okay, you have various trade-offs that a library that, like that could choose. So, which ones to choose for the standard one? So, if we, if we have multiple different ways to, to cut that cake, uh, we would either need to choose a very reasonable default for the standard one or make it flexible and that then requires a very advanced uh, proposal so it's hard and uh, we would like to provide that kind of facilities uh, if we could we would have json and xml and all sorts of things but there are bandwidth problems in the committee for that because we need to apply rather hard scrutiny on the proposals and their specification. So that slows us down in, in how much libraries we can actually put into the uh, standard library specification. So it's fathomable, whether it's practical remains to be seen. Of course, different people in the standard have also different opinions of what should go into the standard and what should not go into the standard. Right? In my mind, the short version of what should go into the standard and special uh, for the library consists of four categories. One, uh, language support, like um, suit exception type info, that has to be in the library. B, something you cannot do if it is not in the library. I.O., for example, if you cannot do I.O., you cannot write a standard version which does I.O. Three, something everything, everybody uses. 90% of the users use these facilities. Vector, string, unordered map. Maybe a few things around that. And then, arguably, there's a fourth category, which is things which are hard to do and have a reasonably large subset of users. Um, linear algebra, special mass, may fit into that. A JSON parser, JSON library? No. You can implement that using standard facilities in a portable way, easy, and you can download a version of that and use it. Not everything has to be in the standard. And of course, I disagree. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that I think we should have in the standard. We had a proposal we don't have in the standard. How many of you think that having a 2D uh, graphics library would be useful? Okay, that is my answer. <laughs> I like this. Can you do 2D without? Sorry? Can you do 2D uh, graphic without having it in the standard? 
The answer is actually no. So that may classify as something like an, a display connectivity thingy, maybe something which may need to be in the standard. Unless you use something like an X11 approach, in which case you don't need it as networking again, but it is arguably that graphic connection may be, may be part of the standard. Okay, okay. and let me touch uh, also other dimension of this, uh, this problem. Sometimes uh, people think something would be very useful, but then nobody wants to work on it. And I will give you an example. Many, many years ago, there was a very reasonable proposal. Wouldn't it be nice to have in the standard library facilities for accessing a relational database, as many other languages have in the standard library? And the answer of the Evolution Working Group was, yeah, of course, we should. Then we established a group and we had in the full committee a single person that, that was volunteering to work on it. So we had to cancel that. So if you want your favorite thing to be in the standard and nobody else wants to work on it, perhaps you have to work on it. That's it. That's the bad part of having a committee of volunteers. I'd like to summarize some of the things that were said. I think what we are lacking today and we are struggling for years now in the committee to get something set up is actually a good support for finding libraries or just using them. We have tools like Conan, there are others by other vendors and it's no, we don't have an established, let's say, the, the infrastructure landscape is so heterogeneous, we don't have an established way to do that, like other languages would have. Uh, Rust crates and uh, Python, uh, what's it called in Python? Pip, pip something, uh, uh, where you just find, have a repository with stuff lying around ready for you to use. And I appreciate the approaches the different uh, package managers are trying to, to achieve, but we lack any means to support that today from the standard committee. And that's, that's one of, of the problems. Also, let's say we select Conan, then Microsoft would be pissed off with VC, VC package or vice versa. And uh, that, is, that is also a problem. People live on selling C++ tooling or maybe working on it or supporting it. And that is kind of, we lack the, the standard committee is not, doesn't have this kind of, uh, how do you say, it, absolutism leader that actually might be able to, to push it, things out that let's say smaller languages might have. And I doubt that this can be solved at all. Well, there are even more dimensions like the more things that you have standardized, the more things that are teachable and when developers reach to the market, they have a common ground and that, that should not be neglected. But I want to hear more non-committee people and then some answers. It's it's a request. I I'm sure it has been done before, but uh, I I've, uh, I'm missing a lot. Uh, one feature from from Python, which is the decorator syntax to compose uh, functions one over another. I don't know if you are familiar with the 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 syntax and the functionality. You have a function, and uh, you have another function, and you can decorate a at symbol. Num name of the function, the first function, and that uh, automatically uh, wraps the second function with the first one. So, for example, you can do things like mem memoization when you define a memoization function, and then you can memoize uh, so uh, the, the um, or function that you want only putting at memoize in in front of the function signature which is very handy in, in, and it's not only for memoization, but uh, it's a simple example for everybody to, uh, to know the, the thing. Okay. Uh, 
I'm going to take uh, two or three interventions and, and then we will have answers. Otherwise, uh, I have a suggestion because I I saw that um, some of the features that you add in the in the standard um, are um, are designed or are needed uh, for high level features. So uh, sometimes maybe it can be useful if you can categorize the features by the by the level by the level of a, of, usage, of a usage in order that for the average um, the C++ developers can go uh, to uh, at uh, to different levels depending on the they are going to uh, to develop i have a concern about all these questions with packaging. Yeah. yeah. So as an example, with Python we have pip, with Rust we have cargo, with uh, JavaScript we have NPM, with Perl we have something else, and then with C++ we have a whole bunch of choices. And what am I to use if my program uses multiple languages? I think, language, I think packaging should not be a language question. We have package management, and we have languages. Those are tools that solve separate problems. Thank you. I tend to agree with that position. Uh, regarding the question about the decorator thing, I think that this may be possible with a new reflection proposal. So maybe maybe i can try to write some kind of proof of concept around that because i think it it actually is yeah okay so you you got you got it uh, i'm a bit annoyed that the synthetic initializers must appear in order why is that the synthetic initializers because in c you can put it in in whatever order but in C plus plus twenty you are forced to put them in order, which is annoying. So the uh, ordering requirement for designated initializers is because we have complex destruction in certain types. C has this funny property that it's surprising to some people that every type is trivial. So there's never a complex cleanup, but C++ does complex cleanup. So like we do initialize class members in the declaration order, we also require the uh, designated initializers to appear in, uh, in the uh, declaration order. We wouldn't strictly have to, but it was a sort of sanity choice made by the committee. It, it, produces certain problems, especially with interoperability with C code. Thanks. The past year we we were here, we commented that um, and it, uh, perhaps a, a simple thing is to uh, has a built-in feature in the C++ languages that allow us to convert an enum to its uh, string representation because it's uh, a feature that could save a lot of time by making functions for overlapping uh, some operators. And I don't know if uh, there is some proposal in order to uh, solve this problem. This should be solved by reflection. So, so it's, it's on the way. I would I would like to have a better debug performance. So if I have a number crunching thing and I want to use strong types, that's usually not well together because debugging then goes into my strong types and into strong types. And so the performance in debug mode then is too worse often. So I cannot use strong types for such cases. My short answer would be that is not a part of the language, is something that implementations need to improve. 
I mean, the, the debugger is not part of the definition of the language itself. So different, different vendors have different debugger implementations. The third is actually, also the third macro can be seen as part of the debugger and it's part of the language. Sir? Isn't it in the standard? Yes, write more unit tests, write more unit tests. But yes, there, there are a couple of features in the standard library on the pipeline uh, so that you can interact with the debugger. But uh, as Peter said, assert has, there is no specification that assert uh, should have any interaction with the debugger. If your vendor da does that, Okay, that's a, that is an extension. It's not part of the standard. Yeah, there is a request uh, for uh, a more fundamental basic request on the C++ language. So basically, uh, I have, let's say I have an anonymous class, in, especially inline anonymous class inheriting from a base class. But then if it's an anonymous class, I cannot give it a constructor or a destructor because it's anonymous. There is no name. What I would like to uh, C++ to have, instead of using the name of the type as the constructor or destructor, why not give it a special name, let, let's say constructor or destructor, as the name of the constructor or destructor, so that an anonymous class could have a constructor and destructor. Yes. Yes, uh, if, if uh, I, this is just for convenience, yes, of course I could give it a name and that would solve, solve. Yes, but uh, my, my, my thing is that, uh, let's say it's inline. I, I, I'd, like, I'd like to have a, a class in, in, inside the function. Classes are cheap. Yeah. Okay, until you use RTTI because they don't cost you anything at runtime. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, again, let, let's say I have an, uh, an array uh, of uh, of a uh, base class and uh, of pointers to the base class. I'd like to uh, use polymorphism on them. So of course I could give each class a name, but if I if I have let's say ten, I I don't like to type. So, a one, a zero as class names, uh, you know. Make make it a class template. Yes, that's also possible. But again, <laughs> it would be very convenient. That's the only thing I, I'm uh, emphasizing. I suggest if you want that feature, try to specify it, put it on standard proposals, and uh, see uh, what you get back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. I can I can just as well comment on that. One last question, can I ask? Yes. Right. But yeah, I mean, don't I, okay. I was wondering, uh, are we allowing user code to forward declare containers, or is it undefined behavior? And if it is undefined behavior, why didn't we get uh, a standard header for forward declaration for containers in the same way as uh, I/O stream utilities? Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Co think you containers can. are templates. Right. Uh, the the thing is, <laughs> <laughs> the standard provides a specification that is open for extension. So you might have a co a, a, a template declaration for vector that you use, which might 
the actual implementation has the leeway to provide additional template parameters that are hidden from you. And that's, that's one of the major reasons to not be able to forward declare things. For example, who actually specifies allocator for vector? Very few, I guess. And that, that is one of the reasons. You cannot actually, uh, there might even be hit more, allocator is, is usually hidden from users. So if you would uh, forward declare vector with just T, you're not forward declaring standard vector. That's, that's the problem there. Yeah. So, so, uh, so let, let me go to a more fundamental question. Why do you want to do that? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, uh, modules. modules will solve that. So <laughs> go to post C20 and you are done. I think uh, Peter's reply is a bit or misleading, or maybe I didn't understand it. I, I, I understand that the type of a vector or any container or any facility in the standard library can have um, additional parameters, etc. But that doesn't prevent the standard from uh, having a, a forward include uh, header. And, uh, and I also understand that the modules are going to save us eventually but this is going to happen in 10 years time. So I think that having forward declare uh, headers in the standard would help a lot users uh, to decrease their build times. This is something I, I contribute to boost and we have to interact a lot with the standard library and not having forward declarations for many standard components is a pain in the ass. <laughs> So uh, Peter is on the queue for a long time. So no, no. Uh, sorry, Wille. Right. Uh, so about that suggestion to uh, have a different syntax for a declaring constructor, that's just not going to happen. We are not going to introduce another way to introduce constructors. So even though you have uh, reasonable use cases for unnamed class types where you would want to define constructors, <laughs> that isn't worth having having two syntaxes for doing something so fundamental. So as Peter said, just name those things, name them whatever short garbage and just leave, go on with your life having to do that. Let, let me, let me uh, take one more poll before we go. Uh, no, I'm going to take a poll uh, uh, before we go for a break. So, how many of you in your current code base are in C++ 14? Okay. For, uh, I mean, 17. Okay, 20. Well, ha yeah, yeah, I know your case. Uh, so, how many of you uh, have plans for migrating to 20 in, let's say, the next 12, 18 months? So it doesn't look like 20 is going to take 10 years. It's, uh, uh, my feeling is that when we, we I, I made this question the first time, uh, when we passed 11, it was like, oh, well, I don't know. And for each new iteration, the adoption cycle of the new release is faster and faster, which is good. And now I, I know that the thing had warmed up uh, a lot, but now we have coffee. <laughs>